Okay, Mr. Baker, you are first. Joe Biden got a really big boost today with this GDP report. Even Janet Yellen, which is very, very rare, took a public victory lap. She never does that. The fact that she did, do you take this as a sign of a new concerted messaging change, an effort from the White House to find a way to get through to the American people how strong the economy is? Because while they're trying to push this message, Today alone, Fox and Friends is doing segments bashing Bidenomics. Larry Kudlow, who knows how the economy works, is talking the number down. Does the White House realize this problem and they've got a new plan? Well, they realize the problem. I think the plan is to hope that these numbers eventually are felt in real time by real people, right? That numbers don't really matter too much to everyday voters if they don't feel it in their own lives. And you see polls over the last few months saying that they didn't feel in their own lives. Now, the last two months, though, you're starting to see a little bit of a change there, too. The Consumer Confidence Index is up, I think, by about 29 percent in the last two months. That's the highest or, or strongest change in such a short amount of time in many years. If that translates into a broader sense of optimism about the economy, if, if the lagging indicators of uh, politics follow the, the numbers so that you know, a month from now, five months from now, especially nine months from now when the president's on the ballot, they are feeling the same thing that these numbers show. Obviously, that works out better for the president than not. But I think the problem is that our politics today aren't necessarily following the old rules. The old rules used to be you had a good economy, you were in pretty good shape. That is not necessarily still the case here. We're in a tribal moment in which people see the economy through their own prism rather than through, you know, factual statistics or, you know, uh, whatever the experts tell them. And messaging seems to matter. Susan, when Donald Trump was in office, he talked about the stock market success. It seemed like every five minutes. He acted as though he was personally responsible for it. Is that why some people still seem to think my 401k was in such good shape when he was in office? It's better now. Today, the S&P 500 closed at an all-time high for the fifth day in a row. That's just a fact. Don't believe your own li lying eyes, Steph. Uh, just believe what I tell you. And Donald Trump, that's his marketing principle. He also believes in the power of repetition. If you say something over and over and over again, it must be true. What did he say? He said, we had the greatest economy in the history of the world over and over and over again uh, with his asterisk for 2020 and the COVID pandemic. What's amazing to me is how many amplifiers he has found among Republican elected officials who know better, of course, among those who understand full well that it was not and never was the greatest economy in the history of the world. But uh, nonetheless, Trump was very skilled at that kind of uh, marketing, propaganda, repetition, whatever you want to call it. And it is settled in to become a kind of new Republican ideology, which is to say whatever Trump said about the economy. So I do think that it's not just about whatever the numbers are right now for Biden, but he's up against a hardened partisan reality when it comes to uh, people's opinions about the economy. And their opinions about America. Peter, you wrote about the two Americas, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, how these two men and their supporters sort of have radically opposed visions than what we've seen in the past. Explain. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we're used to presidential elections that represent you know, two different ideologies, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat. Here you've got, first of all, the first contest between two presidents, a current and a former president, in more than a century. None of us have ever lived to see that. We haven't seen that since 1912. Second of all, each of these presidents really does represent a very, very starkly different idea of America and a sense of ge geographic of America, right? 44 states are so lopsided for one party or the other, they're not even really considered to be a contest this fall. That's blue America and red America right there. These states, you have different laws on things like gun access and abortion access. They have different uh, uh, philosophies about immigration. They have different, uh, you know, all kinds of different realities in those states. And they see reality differently. We're talking about the economy. They, they see the economy differently. And obviously, nobody is more unalike than Joe Biden and Donald Trump, other than their age, which is fairly similar, and the fact that each of them has been president. They are as unalike as possible. And I think they represent this moment in time when our country has polarized to the point that we just don't even really want to be together. We don't uh, live together. We don't uh, want to even respect the other side anymore. And they are the, the, the leaders, in effect, of those two different Americas. 
Susan, I can't guarantee that my spouse is watching right now, but I'm hoping you read Peter's piece today. What do you think? <laughs> well, of course, I agree entirely. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I think the thing is, Donald Trump is the master, unfortunately, of alternate realities. And he set up in, in attacking the legitimacy of the 2020 election, even before that election took place, he laid the pre- cursor for this moment of two Americas, right? He said, I'm going to continue to be the president of Red America, regardless of the outcome of the election. That has been his behavior. I think it's very interesting as a marketing professional, right, that he uh, insists that his supporters and his uh, staff and his retainers and his followers still refer to him as the president. He, uh, there was this really revealing moment in the courtroom today in New York when uh, his lawyer said, I call President uh, Trump and uh, was corrected. You know, no, he's in the courtroom. He's citizen. You know, he's Donald Trump. He's not the current president, but he set it up as if he is literally the president of Red America in juxtaposition to the legitimate president of the whole country, but who he considers only the president of Blue America. I, I think it's a really important and, and, and kind of tragic dynamic for the country right now. Let's talk about Donald Trump taking the stand today. Barbara, what was the point and what does the jury get out of his testimony? It's really interesting, Stephanie, because the only issue before this jury in this case is the damages. The judge has already found that Donald Trump defamed E. Jean Carroll. And so his testimony should have been restricted only to damages. There were a lot of parameters and a lot of rules about what his testimony was, but they got him on the stand just to say, he stands by everything in his deposition. That really opens the door now for his lawyer to be able to argue anything that's contained within that deposition. So in many ways, it's a chance for Donald Trump to relitigate liability and just put that idea in the jury's mind. So even though their verdict is going to be limited to a number, the fact that Donald Trump has now come on, is now on record denying these things could give some suggestion to them that that number ought to be zero. So I think that uh, he got away with one here by testifying. Then I want you just to explain to our audience, basically one of the, I said it before, but one of the only things he said on the stand today was, I just wanted to defend myself, my family, and frankly, the presidency. Explain to our audience why the judge would order that statement be removed. So again, this case is only about damages. And so if his motive, why he's defending things, the fact that he made a statement that he still submits is true. None of that is relevant here to this case. This case is all about numbers. So I think once he got that, that statement in and he continued, the judge was done with him. That's enough. Cross-examination. I think the whole testimony lasted about four minutes. And so it was clear he was not going to play by the rules that the judge had set forth. Uh, he was just trying to squeeze in whatever he could say. But you know, not only, I think, does this demonstrate Donald Trump's inability to follow the rules in the courtroom, but I think he, especially by the way he continues to defame E. Jean Carroll in social media posts and publicly, I think he wants to demonstrate to his supporters that he's above the law. I think he's calculated that whatever he has to pay in this case, he'll pay. He'll crowdsource and fund a fundraise off of it, make as much money as he has to pay. But preserving his political viability is the most important thing. And so demonstrating to the world that I can say whatever I want with impunity is part of that whole image of projecting strength and being a strong man. Republicans have said the border is a top issue. Well, the Senate has been working on a deal that would dedicate billions of dollars to addressing the crisis at the border, a deal that would give Republicans much of what they have been asking for. And guess who put the brakes on it? Donald J. Trump. In a closed door meeting yesterday, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell poured cold water on the deal, saying, quote, we don't want to do anything to undermine him, him as in Donald Trump. He has been pushing Republicans to now oppose the deal so he can use the chaos at the border as an election issue against President Biden. And Mitt Romney called Trump out for doing it. I think the border is a very important issue for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and the fact that he would communicate to uh, Republican senators and Congress people that he doesn't want us to solve the border problem because he wants to blame uh, Biden for it is uh, is really appalling. 
and Republicans are still not on the same page. Some say the deal is still up in the air, and just today, McConnell said they are still working to try and get an outcome. Joining me to discuss, Robert Gibbs, former Obama campaign senior advisor and White House press secretary under President Obama, and Mark McKinnon joins us, former advisor to both George W. Bush and John McCain. Mark, it's fair to say politics is tough and winning is important, but is it important enough to turn down an incredible deal for Republicans on the border crisis just to placate Trump and rob Biden of a win? Well, uh, as Mitt Romney said, it's appalling. And, it, it, you know, for an issue that Republicans have been banging the drum over and over to say it's, an, it's a crisis on the border that's affecting Americans every day, and to, and to suggest that the crisis can be conveniently put off until November uh, for political advantage for Trump, uh, it's just pure hypocrisy. And it just, once again... Uh, sends the message that all Trump really cares about is himself and, and gaining political advantage. It doesn't really care about what's affecting uh, Americans on the border and elsewhere. They're being affected by the, the, the border problem. So uh, it's all about what helps Trump and not what really helps the country. Robert, the two top issue for Republicans we've heard is the economy and the border. The economy is clearly doing well. So is that why Trump wants this deal scratched? Because if you've got a strong economy and the border being addressed, he's got nothing left to run on? Yeah, I mean, it's just clear he wants the issue. He wants the chaos. He wants the crisis. He wants the visual. He wants all that, quite frankly, he didn't solve uh, and has bedeviled, quite frankly, many presidents. Uh, but it's, you know, it's just pure politics at its heart. You know, Stephanie, our politics has changed in an almost countless number of ways in many years, over the many years. I, I remember back in 1996, less than three months before the general election, Bill Clinton's running for re-election against Bob Dole. Newt Gingrich is in charge of a Republican Congress. And that Republican Congress passes a minimum wage increase, a health insurance portability bill written partly by Ted Kennedy, and welfare reform, something Bill Clinton had campaigned on in 1992 and Republicans had campaigned on in 1994. So there's precedent for doing not just issues during an election year, but big issues, uh, unless you decide you'd rather play politics than solve it. Okay, so Mark, let's say Republicans shut this down, nothing happens. Here's my question. How does Joe Biden basically tattletale on the Republicans, because immigration is an issue for American on both sides of the aisle, and an average American is not going to know the intricacies of what's going on in Congress. How does Biden rat him out? Well, I think he stands up and he quotes Mitt Romney, and he quotes others who are saying we had a deal, we had a good deal, and that, uh, that just because Trump wanted political advantage, he wanted to put it off till November. We could have solved it now. So... I think you're right, Stephanie. The, the big issues for Republicans are immigration, the economy. The economy's getting tougher for them to sell, and immigration, they just want to take off the board. All right, Robert, you were the White House press secretary. How would you be telling the story if you were in the White House? Because we do have a problem, but the pres and the president doesn't have open borders, has been trying to do stuff, and Republicans won't play ball. Well, you just flat out have to start by calling it out. You call it out from the White House podium with the White House press secretary uh, starting today, starting tomorrow. Uh, I have a feeling, Stephanie, what Republicans have done is give Joe Biden an enormous opening to use in the State of the Union, which is coming up in a few weeks. And he'll stand out there and he'll stand up and point out people like Tom Tillis and Mitt Romney and others who came out, and I think in a, in, a, you know, in a heartening way today, to call things appalling, to call things immoral, what they're seeing with playing politics rather than solving issues. But I think they've given Joe Biden a big opening. That'll be an enormous audience. Look for him to keep beating that drum. But I bet he really uses it during the State of the Union. Because, look, whether you're Democrat or Republican, the voters that are going to decide this race are in the middle. They want to see both sides compromise, get together, and make progress. This is tailor-made for a fastball down the middle for Joe Biden. Mark, what's Mitch McConnell doing? He is a skilled politician who cares about Ukraine, who cares about the border. Is he now just giving in to Trump? And if so, what does that tell you about this moment in the Republican Party? 
Well, I mean, it, it, it's just more confirmation that Donald Trump has taken over the party wholesale. I mean, Mitch McConnell, we know from the very beginning, had concerns about Trump and his imposition on, on the Senate and uh, whatever's happening in the Congress. But he has folded over and over and over again, uh, despite his opposition and uh, despite, the, you know, his years of being able to run the Senate. But at the end of the day, he's counting votes and he knows that Trump's got a hammer on these guys. Or is there any chance... Mark, that this is, you know, Mitch McConnell, that this is Mitch McConnell, who is no friend of Donald Trump's in the back nine of his own political career, exposing Trump, right? Showing America, showing Republicans, your boy, the guy you love, he doesn't want to do anything about your biggest issue. Well, listen, I, I would, I wouldn't sleep well at night if I were, if I were messing with Mitch McConnell. And I think that whatever, if this deal gets scuttled for whatever reason, I think that McConnell will, in, in in classic McConnell fashion, find a way to get out a knife in the phone booth and, and drop some blood on the floor. Robert, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, I think what, one of the things that Mitch McConnell and others are going to start talking about, uh, because as you rightly mentioned, aid to Ukraine is tied up in this. And so the winner uh, in this deal also is Vladimir Putin. Uh, something mm -hmm. I think you'll hear a lot uh, about also in the State of the Union, also by Joe Biden, and I think also by Republicans that are concerned about what happens if our aid stops and Russia is, is victorious in Ukraine. What does that mean for the rest of Europe? What does that mean for the rest of the world? All of that is bad. We are following major news from Georgia. Donald Trump has officially filed to dismiss the election interference charges against him. Trump's attorney argues that the alleged relationship between Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis and special prosecutor Nathan Wade is grounds to dismiss the indictment completely and disqualify both of them. Barbara McQuaid is still with us. Okay, Barbara, before we get into the Trump aspect of this, this is all based on Fonnie Willis and her conduct. For people who have not been following this, explain the allegations. So there's an allegation that Fannie Willis hired as a special counsel, someone with whom she is in a personal romantic relationship. She hired three special counsels to assist with the RICO case against Donald Trump and 18 other defendants. Not uncommon to hire additional lawyers to come in and help when there's a big case like that. But certainly it would be an ethical violation to be supervising the subordinate, there are also allegations that she's paying him, she's overpaying him, and that she has benefited from the fruits of those payments by going on vacations with him that he paid for with those same funds. Okay, what she's accused of, though, does that have any bearing on what Trump and his co-defendants are accused of? No, and that is the most important question of all. These are two very separate things. She may have a very serious ethical problem on her hands. That is a conflict of interest between her and the people of Fulton County and the office that she manages as a manager. A dismissal would be required only if there is a conflict of interest between Fannie Willis and Donald Trump or the defendants in this case. There is no conflict between uh, Fannie Willis and any of them. And so the idea that this would somehow turn into a motion dismiss is, is really absurd. There's just no chance of that. Uh, this has no bearing whatsoever on the guilt or innocence of Donald Trump. So she may have an ethical issue. There may be sanctions involved for her. And certainly Donald Trump smells blood. And so he's going to exploit this opportunity and get people talking about it. Uh, but I see in no way this would result in the dismissal of those charges. So then put the dismissal aside. There's no chance that'll happen. This is a huge political win for him, is it not? I mean, it is terrible optics. And in the court of public opinion, which is the court he cares most about, this is a dream come true. Yeah, it, I think it is uh, because it, it taints the prosecutor. It undermines her credibility. Uh, you know, there is this issue about race where she was in a church defending herself um, and, and accusing the uh, Trump team and his co-defendant of singling out Nathan Wade because he is the one of the three prosecutors who is African-American. Well, you know, he's also the only one with whom she's alleged to be having an affair. And so... I think Trump has now also seized on race and alleged that she is acting unethically by injecting race into the conversation. I don't know that that will result in any sanctions, but I do think that gives him the opportunity to do what he loves to do best, which is to polarize people. 
to talk about us versus them to other her to other everyone else in this case. And so I think it does play into his hands as a political strategy.